Good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the Biochemical Society and Portland Press, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, which is part of our Biochemistry Focus webinar series. Topics in the series include different research areas in the molecular biosciences, as well as uh, practical sessions to support career development. And each we webinar will give you the opportunity to ask questions by text. And we also welcome suggestions for future topics and uh, speakers uh, to feature in our webinar series. Please um, have a look at our website for more details. My name is Dr. Sarah Anjumani Virmoni. I'm a neuroscientist and uh, lecturer in, um, at Brunel University of London, and I'm chairing the session today. So our invited speaker today is Professor Eric Richter from University of uh, Copenhagen uh, from Denmark, and he's the recipient of the 2021 Biochemical Society Award. Exercise is a catabolic event and therefore requires mobilization of fuels and oxidation of these fuels in the working muscles. This re requires a plethora of molecular signaling in muscles, um, as well as specific neuroendocrine uh, stress response. This includes neuroendocrine activity that activates uh, lipolysis in uh, adipose tissues and increase hepatic uh, glucose production to avoid a decrease in plasma glucose due to increased glucose uptake by muscle. Different modes of exercise induce um, um, different by overlapping um, neuroendocrine secretion as well as different molecular signaling in muscle. Our knowledge of this molecular signaling in skeletal muscle during exercise has exploded due to various novel proteomic techniques and much of this signaling has no known function and therefore this challenge is now to figure out the functional consequences of these myriads uh, of signaling. In contrast to the catabolic conditions during exercise, the post-exercise condition is anabolic with priority given to refilling of muscle glycogen stores. This is facilitated by the post-exercise increase in muscle insulin uh, action, which is due to a coordinated increase in insulin-induced uh, microvascular perfusion and molecular signaling. During his uh, award lecture, Professor Richter will discuss these different aspects of um, exercise. Now, questions will be asked after Eric's presentation, but you can send in your questions during the talk. If you have a question, please type it in the question box as shown um, in the image on the screen. And we will try to answer as many as time allows. I just hand it over to Eric. Um, Eric, if you could please share your screen, that would be great. Excellent. Eric, we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, see if we can get it in presenter mode. Um, well, anyway, um, thank you very much, Sarah, for this introduction. <clears throat> it's a huge honor for me today to uh, to have been awarded this uh, award that uh, bears the name of such a distinguished scientist as Sir Philip Randall. And uh, it's also, uh, I would like to thank the, the Biochemical Society for giving me the opportunity to uh, share some of the work that we've done over the years, as well as some uh, unpublished work. Let's see here. So, um, a few weeks ago, uh, one of our PhD students defended his PhD thesis, and he started his defense by showing a black slide like I do, 
symbolizing the dark situation in Europe and particularly in Ukraine. I think that was an appropriate gesture and I'm just copying it to remind everybody of the cruel war that Russia is conducting in Ukraine, which can only be condemned in the most forceful way. But returning to science, Sir Philip Randall uh, described the glucose fatty acid cycle. He did many things, but one of them was that this glucose fatty acid cycle. And he, he believed that this uh, cycle could explain how fatty acids could induce insulin resistance. And the work was carried on in the diaphragm, isolated diaphragm muscle from rats. The idea is that a, a load, an increased load in fatty acids leads to increased fatty acid oxidation, production of acetyl-CoA and citrate. And while the acetyl-CoA can inhibit PDH, you put a break on uh, uh, carbohydrate oxidation. Citrate can leave the mitochondria and can inhibit PFK. And PFK inhibition leads to an uh, uh, accumulation of GX, G6P, which can then inhibit hexokinase, and that can lead to accumulation of glucose inside the cell, and therefore a smaller gradient, and therefore decreased glucose uptake. Now, we know now in humans that if you increase fatty acids in the plasma by infusing intralipid, we get a nice decrease in insulin sensitivity, so the, the cycle certainly works in humans. Uh, but at the time, we were inspired to see if the cycle also worked during exercise. You can appreciate that uh, this study was published in 1991, and it was a collaboration with Mark Hargreaves, who was working with us at the time, and Ben Keynes and myself uh, performed this uh, study where we uh, looked at the effect of increasing pre-fatty acid concentrations on glucose uptake uh, during exercise inspired by the findings by Sir Philip Randall. And what we did was we used this one-legged exercise model where subjects uh, perform dynamic exercise with one leg. And since we also had catheterized the femoral artery and the femoral vein, we could measure leg glucose uptake because that is the leg AV difference of glucose times the leg blood flow. And as you can appreciate over here on the right side, the glucose uptake in the control condition, this was in overnight fasted individuals, increased nicely with exercise as we know it should, and it decreases fairly rapidly upon exercise discontinuation. We then let the subjects rest for a while and infused intralipid to increase the fatty acid concentration to about 1.2 millimolar, which is about twice as high as the overnight fasted condition. We then repeated the exercise with the other leg. And as you can see, there was a nice, or there was a clear reduction in glucose uptake in the, in the condition where fatty acids were increased compared to the control conditions. So uh, the concept works uh, also during exercise. We weren't really able to confirm the molecular mechanisms, but at least the concept of increased uh, or decreased glucose uptake during exercise with high fatty acids uh, was confirmed in exercise as well as uh, during uh, rest. So you might ask, why are we at all interested in exercise? Good question. So the answer is, of course, uh, scientific curiosity is one thing. How does the body handle a disturbance of homeostasis? How is fuel consumption regulated? And we also know that exercise has health benefits, and we can then ask, what are the molecular mechanisms behind the health benefits? I don't think we know that, uh, at least not uh, completely at this point. Many of the beneficial effects of exercise do actually arise from the contracting muscle because muscle itself improves its metabolic capacity and function by exercise. And muscle mass and muscle health is related to longevity. We know that from epidemiological studies. And muscles can also secrete myokines and extracellular vesicles that can communicate with other organs in a favorable manner. So, but, but exercise is not just one thing. Uh, 
there can be different intensities, durations, endurance exercise versus resistance exercise, high intensity interval exercise is quite popular these days. So you can ask the questions, what is the difference in molecular signaling between different exercise modalities? And this uh, figure is from a publication by John Hawley in Cell Metabolism back in 2014. And this picks the differences that we know are uh, found between uh, endurance exercise and resistance exercise. And endurance exercise activates MP kinase, PGC1 alpha, and it leads to mitochondrial biogenesis, whereas resistance exercise uh, uh, activates mTOR and leads to protein translation and hypertrophy instead of mitochondrial biogenesis. And you can see that the different enzymes here are actually activated with phosphorylation or dephosphorylation uh, pathways. And I think it's fair to say that phosphorylation and dephosphorylation is one of the major, maybe the major way to uh, regulate enzyme activity in the, in the tissues. So if you then, if you accept that, and then you go to the Phosphocyte Plus database, which is a database that catalogs all the different phosphocytes in the human body. In 2019, there were cataloged 234,959 phosphocytes. And today it's, uh, I think, 239,000 or something like that. But the point is that of all these phosphocytes, only about 3% of them have a reported function. And only about 3% have a reported kinase that is known to act to uh, phosphorylate these phosphocytes. So there's a huge black box or here a black circle that uh, contains a lot of phosphocytes that we do not know much about. So in terms of exercise signaling, um, to, to get a little bit more uh, insight into the uh, exercise signaling, we uh, performed a study in collaboration with David James's lab in uh, Sydney. And this was a phosphoproteomic study, which is a great discovery tool. And we published it in 2015 in Cell Metabolism, looking at the global phosphoproteomic analysis of human skeletal muscle during exercise. So to get a global, as much as we could at the time, a global view of the, uh, of the uh, uh, phosphoproteome. It was a fairly simple study, only four subjects. We biopsied the skeletal muscle at rest, and then we put the, the guys on a bicycle, and they exercised at a fairly high intensity for 10 minutes, and then we took the biopsy again from the, uh, the post-exercise uh, condition, sent the muscle to David James's lab, and here Nolan Hoffman and Ben Parker were the main uh, workers to uh, identify uh, 8,511 phosphocytes in the muscles, and about 1,000 of these were actually regulated during exercise. And, and the astonishing, astonishing thing is that only about 10% of these phosphocytes were previously known to be regulated during exercise. So there were 90% of these 1,000 phosphocytes were not previously known to be regulated during exercise. So we can then say with more than a thousand phosphocytes regulated during 10 minutes of intense exercise, then you might ask which ones are actually important for phenotypic developments and which ones are related to the health benefits of exercise. We do know that all kinds of exercise improve health, but different modes of exercise induce different signaling and different phenotypes. So which exercise induced signaling is important for health? And we then formulated the hypothesis that maybe the common signaling in different exercise modes may be the most important for health effects of exercise. And to test uh, that uh, hypothesis, we performed a new study, which is currently unpublished, 
this was with Christian Karl as a PhD student, Christian Wolstedlund as a master student, Ben de Keynes was there, and Ben, de, ben Parker was also uh, the fossil proteomic guy uh, involved. So what we did was we recruited in Copenhagen, we recruited eight subjects. These were young men. They were uh, lean and they had a VO2 max, a VO2 peak around 42. So that indicates that they are like most young men in the Copenhagen area. That means they use the bicycle for local transportation and they engage in leisure time physical activity maybe once or twice a week. So they're not at all endurance trained, but they're not couch potatoes either. But the unique thing about this study is that these eight subjects came to the lab three times and with 14 days in between and performed either endurance exercise, resistance exercise, or sprint exercise. So the endurance was 90 minutes cycling at around 60% VO2 peak. Resistance was six times 10 RM knee extension exercise, which took about 15 minutes, including the pauses between the sets. And sprint was only three times 30 seconds all out cycling, a wind gate test actually. And that took also about 15 minutes, including warm up and, and the, and the pauses. And just uh, to show you what we did, we took muscle biopsies as well as blood samples before exercise, right after completion of either of these uh, exercise modes, and then again after three hours recovery in the fasting state. So they were not fit, they were just lying there uh, and recovering uh, in the fasting state. So just to reiterate what, what we think is, is quite unique by this study is that we have these three exercise modes or modalities. They each induce modality specific signaling, but we also believe that they will induce some common core canonical exercise signaling, we can call it, that might be the most important. Uh, for, uh, let's say, the health benefits of exercise. But of course, that can be discussed. So just to show you what the uh, systemic load is during these different exercise modalities, you can see a remarkable increase in uh, lactate. So with uh, sprint exercise, we reach around 15 millimoles uh, per liter of lactate. With resistance, we reach about eight, and with endurance, nothing really goes on uh, during uh, in terms of lactate production. And you can also see it takes actually two hours for the lactate to come down after re after sprint exercise to resting levels. You can also see plasma adrenaline is markedly increased with sprint. Not a lot is happening with the two other modalities. And plasma noradrenaline again is also markedly up with sprint and not so much with the two other uh, modalities. So that shows you that the systemic load, the cardiovascular load and, and just the total load on the body is much different between the different modalities. And uh, if, but if we look at muscle glycogen breakdown, you can see here an endurance sprint and resistance that the decrease in muscle glycogen is basically similar within the three different uh, exercise modalities, despite the very different uh, work loads and work uh, time that, that was involved. So pretty much the same and nothing really happens in terms of synthesis because they were not fit. So there's not much to build uh, glycogen on. So Ben Parker uh, performed uh, phosphoproteomics in, in these guys. And he was able to identify this time 11,217 phosphocytes and 5,737 were regulated during one of the, diff at least during one of the different uh, exercise modalities. And um, <clears throat> if we look at, at uh, how the Venn diagram looks, these circles indicate the number of phosphocytes that are regulated from comparing immediate post-exercise with the resting state. 
and you can see that uh, the sprint exercise has the largest number of phosphocytes regulated 2800 resistance is number two has 2300 and endurance has the least number even though they exercised for 90 90 minutes so you can also see that there's quite a difference between which phosphocytes are actually regulated during the three different modes. And you can also see that there is there, there are some 428 sites that are actually common to the different phosphocytes, to the different modalities. Um, so this we could call the canonical exercise phosphorylation or phosphocytes. And here are the, the volcano plots, and there are lots of, of different hits, and I can't go through them all, but one thing you could uh, pay attention to is that PDH is dephosphorylated in all uh, exercise modalities, probably important for the increase in carbohydrate oxidation that uh, occurs during uh, either of these uh, exercise modalities. Now we can also look at which kinases are regulated during uh, the different exercise modalities. And this is, uh, uh, here we have the predicted kinase activities from kinase substrate relation. So that means if a substrate has an increased phosphorylation and we know which kinase is doing this, we, th we say that the kinase has an increased activity. And if it's decreased, then the kinase activity is probably decreased. And this is for endurance, this is for sprint, and this is for resistance exercise. And you can see that there are uh, hom homologies, but there are also differences. For instance, PKA, which is this one, is uh, upregulated in all modalities, but least in endurance, probably because the catacolds were least uh, upregulated in endurance exercise. Cyclic GMP-dependent protein kinase is upregulated in all modalities. But you can also see that mTOR is actually uh, decreased in activity uh, during exercise. And AMP kinase is uh, activated in all modalities, and there are lots of, of kinases here. If we go to AKT, then we see that there's not a lot going on, uh, maybe a little bit uh, decrease in activity. And this is what we usually find, that AKT phosphorylation is not really changed during exercise uh, in, in, in any way. So if we then uh, concentrate on the canonical exercise regulated phosphorylations, then again, we find 428 phosphocytes on 116 proteins that are regulated mostly in a similar direction in all three exercise modalities. And here's a heat map showing the different uh, modalities, endurance, sprint, again, and resistance. This is uh, uh, showing increased phosphocytes uh, immediately after exercise, and this is decreased uh, phosphocytes, this is during recovery. Again, in sprint, immediately after exercise and recovery, and resistance immediately after exercise and in recovery. And you can see that the heat map looks pretty much similar in all three uh, modalities, indicating that this common signaling is mostly uh, either activated or, or the phosphocytes are either uh, increased phosphorylated or decreased phosphorylated, but there were around 5% of the phosphocytes that were actually differentially regulated during these three of phosphocytes, but 95% of them were regulated in the same manner. And if we try to look which ones uh, we actually find, then this uh, shows you uh, uh, sites that are increased in phosphorylation, and here we have decreased phosphorylation. And the size of the of the circle shows you the uh, the p value and the and the uh, the distance from the zero line shows you the phosphorylation in uh, intensity you can see. So one of them is STDB1, which is starch binding protein one, which is actually a protein that is thought to uh, chaperone glycogen into lysosomes. So a different way of uh, breaking down glycogen. 
So this is phosphorylated during exercise. Phospho phosphorylase kinase A1 is a subunit of phosphorylase kinase that activates phosphorylase that is important for glycogen breakdown, of course. Titan has a, has a phosphorylation site. FHL3, <clears throat> uh, which is involved in the actin uh, cytoskeleton dynamics, and it stands for four and a half limb domain three. And then there are some that are dephosphorylated. Again, PDH is dephosphorylated quite a lot. And then we find AMP kinase alpha 2, serine 377. And um, this is a recently discovered phosphorylation site on AMP kinase alpha 2. And as you can see, it uh, decreases with exercise in all three modalities. And in the recovery period, it actually increases above the resting state uh, only in endurance and it hasn't really reached it with sprint and resistance. And the reason that I'm, I'm focusing a little bit on this is it will become apparent that this is involved in uh, regulating uh, insulin sensitivity which I will talk about at the end uh, of my talk. So we have all these uh, phosphocytes and also the, the 428 common phosphocytes that are in the canonical exercise phosphoproteome. And if you want to s figure out or at least get an a idea of whether they actually play any role in, uh, in preventing uh, diseases or treating diseases, we did an integration of the canonical exercise phosphoproteome with several recent GWAS uh, catalogs. And then you get this uh, picture. And it shows you all the or some all the phospho sites on the different uh, proteins that have been shown. To, so if they have a genetic variant, then this genetic variant has been shown, for instance, to be associated with type two diabetes or with regulation of BMI or bone mineral density and so on. So these proteins are all in the canonical exercise proteome, phospho proteome, but they are somehow related to uh, disease states. And one of them for, is uh, uh, one that we recognize, tbc one d 4 which has been described in, a, as a, in Greenlandic uh, Inuits that there's a variant that confers muscle insulin resistance and type two diabetes. There's a protein uh, called Wolframin-1 that regulates calcium in the cells. There is, for instance, E3 ubiquitin protein ligase prior to that is involved in protein degradation. Rho GTPase activating protein that is involved in, in uh, for instance, uh, RAC1 uh, regulation, which we know RAC1 is involved in insulin uh, sensitivity and uh, glucose metabolism. So, so mapping these proteins in the canonical exercise phosphoproteome that have known genetic variants that are related to disease, I think somehow uh, makes it uh, probable that they that the changes that we see with exercise could be related to some of these uh, disease states. And I think they present a rich resource for functional uh, follow-up studies for all these different proteins. So let's just briefly go to recovery after exercise. So this was three hours after recovery, no food. And you can see now that the size of the circles are quite different. This is what they looked like in uh, right after exercise. But now you can see remarkably actually that the, the sprint exercise circle has actually enlarged. So that means that following three hours of recovery after a sprint exercise, we actually have more phosphocytes regulated than right after exercise. And also you can see the endurance uh, exercise phospho, uh, phosphocytes have been diminished to quite a few. So most of the phosphorylations that occurred during endurance exercise are actually gone after three hours recovery. Whereas with sprint, we have more and with Resistance are also fewer than during uh, exercise, but not as uh, remarkable as for the endurance exercise. 
And the pathways that are involved are in, the, in resistance exercise or in sprint exercise, recovery is ubiqu ubiquitination and proteasome degradation, muscle contraction, striated muscle contraction, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and protein uh, processing in endoplasmatic reticulum and ubiquitin mediated proteolysis. So uh, quite a little, uh, quite a bit that is involved in uh, protein degradation. And it probably uh, indicates that after sprint exercise, which is very intense, there is a lot of muscle remodeling going on in the recovery from, uh, from, these, uh, from this event. So summary of this uh, part of my talk then is we have described three very different phosphoproteomes of endurance, sprint and resistance exercise, also in recovery. We have identified the canonical muscle exercise phosphoproteome common to three different exercise modes. Perhaps these are the most important ones for health. Some of these were associated with genetic variants related to diseases and therefore present a rich resource for functional follow-up studies. <clears throat> So we've talked about uh, exercise and uh, a little bit about recovery in the fasted state, but uh, exercises, as we heard, uh, a catabolic event and uh, recovery is probably more an anabolic event, event. So following exercise of all sorts, we go into recovery. And here we, uh, rebuild our fuel stores and start the phenotypic adaptations following exercise. <clears throat> and in the recovery phase, most people ingest some sort of, of calories and that leads to increased insulin secretion. And rebuilding fuel stores is facilitated by an increased insulin sensitivity in the muscles that were engaged in exercise. And many years ago, back in the 80s, when I was a postdoc in Neil Ruderman's lab in Boston at Boston University Medical Center, we uh, wanted to investigate whether we could figure out why hypoglycemia is often seen in type 1 diabetics treated with insulin many hours after exercise. And what we used was a rat model where we perfused the hind limbs, the isolated hind limbs in vitro. Uh, with increasing insulin concentrations, and then we measured glucose uptake in these uh, hind limbs. And then we got a dose response curve like this, and the rats that had their hind limbs perfused had either been resting in their cage, or they had run for 30 minutes on a treadmill at a moderate intensity before they were perfused. And as you can appreciate, this curve that is the exercise curve is shifted to the left, indicating that there's an increased insulin sensitivity following exercise um, in, in muscles that had actually exercised. And you can see the half maximally stimulating insulin concentration is reduced quite uh, remarkably. Um, so that has implications for, of course, rebuilding fuel stores because increased insulin sensitivity will channel the uh, glucose into the muscles that uh, need it for glycogen resynthesis, but it also has implications for people with insulin resistance that we know is a, re is a uh, risk factor for developing type 2 diabetes, perhaps also hypertension and dyslipidemia. So one of the explanations for the beneficial effects of exercise in these patients could be the increased insulin sensitivity following a single bout of exercise. Now, um, in Copenhagen, we have used uh, um, a human model. It's not a perfused model uh, in vitro, but in, it's actually as close as we could get to it in vivo. So we have a subject exercising one leg, again, with an X tensor model, so a dynamic exercise for one hour. The other leg is a resting control leg. We then let the subjects uh, rest for four hours, and the reason is, that we want the exercise induced increased glucose uptake to revert to the basal level 
which it does within two to three to four hours. And it, during those four hours, we also put in catheters in the femoral artery and in both femoral veins, so that we again, like we saw in the beginning of the talk, can measure glucose uptake in each leg. And the beauty, of course, is that the two legs are perfused with exactly the same blood coming from this uh, individual. After four hours, we then uh, perform a euglycemic hyperinsulinemic clamp and raise the plasma insulin concentration to a pretty high, but still within the physiological range of uh, insulin. And if you do that, you get a curve uh, something like this. Um, here we have the glucose uptake in the previously rested leg, the full line, and the exercise leg, this line. And you can see before insulin infusion here, the clamp starts here. Before insulin infusion, the glucose uptake is very low in both legs. And as soon as we start the insulin infusion, there's a rapid increase in leg glucose uptake in both legs. But you can appreciate that the increase is much larger in the exercise leg compared to the previously rested leg. And you can also appreciate that the rate with which the increase is happening is much faster in the exercise leg compared to the rested leg. And what could the reason be for that? Could it be delivery of glucose or insulin that is enhanced in the exercise leg? Or is it molecular signaling that is uh, increased? <clears throat> so um, to get a handle on that, at least the, uh, the delivery issue, we uh, performed this study driven by spearheaded by Kim Schuber and then McConnell, who was visiting at the time. And we uh, looked at microvascular perfusion and molecular signaling following exercise during a clamp. And the method we used was uh, the uh, contrast-enhanced ultrasound method. And the idea is here that you infuse microbubbles that are of the size of a red blood cell or a little bit smaller which means that it can enter a capillary if the capillary is perfused. And you get an echo from these uh, microbubbles with ultrasound. And so th all these white specks here are actually echoes from uh, microbubbles. And this is uh, a muscle, uh, uh, in region of interest in a muscle. Here, up, here you have the uh, skin. This is subcutaneous adipose tissue. And then we have the muscle fascia, and this is a region of interest inside the muscle. And you can appreciate that there are more uh, white signals in the exercise leg compared to the rested leg in the same individual. And this is during the clamp, uh, at least four hours following exercise. And what I'll show you now is a little video where you will see that there is a, a sharp light, and that is a high energy burst of ultrasound that destroys all the bubbles in the region. And then you actually image the refilling of uh, the bubbles in the vasculature in the muscle. Uh, let's see if we can get it to work. No. There. You can see the burst, and you can then appreciate the filling of the uh, microbubbles into the vascular space. And you can appreciate that in the exercise leg, there's a more, many more and more homogeneous distribution of the microbubbles compared to the rest of the leg. And in this study, we also manipulated the blood flow. So by infusing uh, a vasoactive drug like LNNMA, which is a NOS inhibitor, we could decrease the blood flow in both legs. And when we decreased the blood flow, so there was no further, there was no increased perfusion in the exercise leg, we also decreased the increased insulin sensitivity, showing that the uh, increased microvascular perfusion following exercise during insulin stimulation is an important part of the increased insulin sensitivity following exercise. So that is an important part but what about molecular signaling? So uh, 20, uh, 20 or more years ago, we uh, started on molecular techniques in the lab 
and uh, spearheaded by Jørn and the studies performed with Jørn and Bente, we again performed the same study. One legged exercise, four hours rest, and then a clamp. And in this uh, study, we actually took biopsies, you can see here before exercise, and this is AKT phosphorylation, I should say on serine 473. Very low phosphorylation, as you can also appreciate here at, in the resting state. But then already after seven minutes of exercise, we see a marked increase in phosphorylation. 15 minutes after exercise, 60 minutes after exercise, and 120 minutes after exercise. And you can see when we then discontinue the insulin infusion, the phosphorylation goes down again. And what I think is, is important to realize is the rapidity with which it happens. Also, there's no real difference between the exercise and the previously rested leg. And you can also see you reach a plateau, which is maintained as long as the insulin infusion is going on. And then it decreases again following discontinuation. So no change in AKT phosphorylation in exercising uh, in exercise leg and other parts of the proximal insulin signaling cascade were also not changed. But if we go a little bit further, we get into TBC1D4. Remember we talked about that in the, uh, in the GWAS uh, inter interactome or interaction. TBC1D4 has several phosphorylation sites and one of them is 704, serine 704. And this is actually uh, uh, phosphorylated during exercise. And it, the increased phosphorylation is maintained four hours following uh, exercise. And TBC1 D4 is, is uh, regulating RAP proteins, so, which are in, involved in GLUT4 translocation. So it has a direct role in regulating glucose uptake. Now, if you then uh, stimulate the muscle with insulin, as we do during the clamp, you can see there's a further increase in phosphorylation, both in the rested leg, but also in the exercised leg. So that indicates that there is a continuously higher phosphorylation in the exercised leg compared to the rested leg. And one of the reasons for thinking that TBC1D4 is so important in post-exercise insulin sensitivity is studies by Rasmus Kipstad and Jan Wojtaszewski who showed that if you knock out TBC1-T4 in mice, then the post-exercise increased insulin sensitivity is no longer uh, found. And then finally, uh, since we did uh, phosphoproteomics during exercise, it was also natural to do it during uh, the post-exercise period, and in a, in a paper that was recently published in Nature Biotechnology, it was introduced that something called personalized phosphoproteomics, and this study was again as a collaboration of, with Copenhagen and um, David James's lab in Sydney, and the Copenhagen part <clears throat> was uh, performed in collaboration with young guns like Jan Hings, Johan Arnslev, Jonas Christensen, Bende and Jørn, who was a spearhead a driver of this project in Copenhagen. So the subjects exercised, again, one leg, not the other leg. Now it says two and a half hours, doesn't really matter. It's the same if they just did one hour, rested for four hours, biopsies were collected. Uh, in the rested leg and in the exercise leg before insulin. Then we performed the clamp and biopsy again at the end of the clamp in both legs. And if you mean the, the values, you would probably get a curve like we saw before. But here uh, we took advantage of the individual responses are uh, different so these are individual responses from five subjects, one, two, three, four, five, and you can see the response to insulin in the rested leg is quite different from in, in this subject number one compared to number five. And you can also see that the blue lines are from the exercised leg, and you can see they are always higher the, than the rested leg. And you can also see that the uh, response to exercise is quite different 
So this guy has a response of this magnitude. Number four has a huge response to exercise. And uh, this guy has a very small uh, response. So there is a, a large individual difference in response to insulin and also in the insulin sensitizing effect of exercise. So muscles were again analyzed in David James's lab. Sean Humphrey and Elise Needham were at the front of this uh, part of the study. And they identified 11,000 uh, phosphocytes, of which 2,000 were actually regulated during uh, these procedures. Then returning to AMP kinase, alpha 2, serine 377. Remember, this was down, the phosphorylation was down in all exercise modalities when we looked at the three different exercise modalities, and it was up following endurance exercise. So again, in this study, it was actually the study that identified this site. We can see that in the uh, re in the exercise leg, four hours after exercise, we have values that are increased compared to the non-exercise leg. And with insulin during the clamp, there is an increased phosphorylation in both the exercise muscle and the non-exercise muscle. And uh, very interestingly, if you then correlate AMP kinase phosphorylation on this site with leg glucose uptake, you get a nice uh, correlation between, uh, or a nice correlation, perhaps indicating that this phosphocytes of AMP kinase is uh, regulating glucose uptake in these individuals. Now, AMP kinase uh, 377, serine 377, fits the motif of uh, mTORC1. And in fact, uh, with the help of John Oakhill, we could show that uh, it is in fact a substrate because if you incubate AMP kinase uh, in vitro with different kinases and look at the phosphorylation of uh, this site, you can see that mTORC1 is a very good uh, phosphorylator, whereas an other kinase is, is not very good and control is really bad. And you can also see in vivo that the insulin effect is uh, blocked by rapamycin or rapamycin-link, which are two inhibitors of mTORC1. So, in summary, um, exercise increases muscle insulin sensitivity due to increased microvascular perfusion and increased molecular signaling. Personalized phosphoproteomics show the next level of exercise effects on muscle insulin signaling. There were many more uh, interesting correlations and I showed you with AMP kinase, so that's a huge uh, novel signaling that was revealed in this uh, publication. And uh, just focusing on AMP kinase uh, is a novel AMP kinase phosphorylation site that correlates with increased insulin action on uh, glucose uptake. So with that, um, I hope I have given you some overview of what uh, some of the research I've been doing over the years has come to. Uh, I think, I hope I have shown you that uh, what we try to do is to combine uh, relatively difficult in vivo uh, invasive studies in humans with cutting edge uh, analytical techniques so that we can uh, combine these two ways to achieve a novel insight in regulation of metabolism and insulin sensitivity. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators for these studies at my university, Bente Keens and Jan Wojciechewski, I've worked with for many, many years, Kim Schuber almost as long, and then there are some younger people, Christian Karl, Christian Wolstel and Johan Onslow, Jonas Christensen, Jan Hinks, and Glenn McConnell, who visited us during some of the studies. University of Sydney with David James, that we've collaborated with many times, and now with Elise Needham and Sean Humphrey. Ben Parker at University of Melbourne is now an independent investigator at uh, Melbourne University and has the Ronnie and Jan Kitt with him and Joan Oakhill was uh, helpful in St. Vincent's Institute of Medical Research. And finally, of course, my section, the August Crow section of molecular physiology that I'm uh, part of, 
where we have all these uh, incredibly uh, inspiring young people that makes it uh, interesting and enjoyable to go to work. So uh, thank you to everybody and thank you for listening. Eric, thank you very much for the great presentation. It was excellent, very exciting. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Professor Eric Richter is the recipient of the 2021 Sir Philip Randall Award. And uh, the, the Sir Philip Randall Lectureship is awarded biennially to a scientist from any part of the world. The awardee is selected on the basis of their contribution to the understanding of mammalian metabolism. So Eric, congratulations on this award. Um, we would have loved presenting this award to you in person, uh, but this will be sent to you by post. So in the meantime, um, you can see a picture of the award that has um, already been engraved with your details. Um, hopefully we can see this on the screen. Right. I'll just wait for a couple of seconds. Hopefully we can see the image. Excellent. Yep. There you go. Brilliant. So we, we can now welcome questions uh, for Eric. If you have any question, please type it in the question box. Um, as uh, you can see on the uh, right hand side of the screen. Um, so I have already two questions. Um, so I will start with the first question. I, myself, I have two questions as well. So depending on the time, if uh, time allows, um, at the end, I will ask also those questions. So the first question from Andrea Moller. Um, congratulations with the Philip Randall Award, Eric, uh, in your new study comparing sprint uh, endurance and resistant exercise. Have you considered any effect of repeated biopsy sampling? Even with only one biopsy in each leg, circulating factors uh, could cause some responses in the alternate leg. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a valid assumption. Um, we cannot rule it out, of course, because you do you do inflict a little bit of injury when you take a muscle biopsy. But we are careful to take the second biopsy in in the other leg, of course, which has not been biopsied before when we take the second biopsy. But when you take the third, you have to take it in either the, the leg where you took the first one or the other one. And we, what we do is we space the biopsies by at least five to six centimeters so that we don't biopsy in the same area where we have uh, biopsied the first, or taken the first biopsy. But we cannot, of course, rule out that there are uh, circulating factors that could uh, influence the other leg. Uh, that's that's not really possible now. But but if you're worried about uh, effects on, on insulin action, I mean we've also carried out studies where we on alternate days study exercise insulin sensitivity versus rested in the same individuals, and there we of course we also see the increased insulin sensitivity. So I don't think it matters too much in in the uh, interpretation of our data. Thank you, Eric. And uh, next question. Um, so what is the fiber type content of the studied muscle? Uh, hmm. This question is from Anna Wagner. Yeah, so so this we biopsy is a human vastus lateralis muscle. And this is usually, I mean, there can be variations between subjects, of course, but usually it's about 50% type one fibers and then uh, 30 to uh, 35 percent type 2a fibers and then 10 to 15 percent type 2x fibers uh, depending on the training status because if you're very well trained you will have very few type 2x fibers but these guys are, are not uh, endurance trained so so i think that'll be pretty much what what we would expect to find Thank you. And next question. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Professor Eric. What do you think of the idea that insulin resistance is an adaptive mechanism that's mainly driven by the uh, nutritional status? This is by Met Nani. Um, well, what do I think? I think that, that uh, we know that obesity is usually uh, accompanied by, 
by insulin resistance. So I think that's absolutely a possibility. And um, we also, but we also know that, that some obese individuals are not really that insulin resistant, some are. So there's a big variation. And I don't think we understand the difference between why some are uh, resistant and some are not insulin resistant. But uh, exercise we know uh, works in uh, people that are uh, insulin resistant, as well as in people who are uh, have a normal insulin sensitivity. So insulin resistance is certainly something that can benefit in terms of with with the exercise of various sorts. Yeah. Thank you. Um, do you think the increase in specific phosphatides, uh, uh, phosphatides per exercise type is dependent on duration of the activity? Uh, well, it, it could be, but but uh, I mean, if 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 you go to what what we found was that the least number of phosphatides regulated were actually endurance exercise, and that took ninety minutes an hour and a half and uh, compared to sprint where you actually only work for three times 30 seconds uh, the number was much higher so i think uh, duration in itself may not be the most uh, the most strong regulator i think it's it's much more uh, intensity that is uh, important and i also think that perhaps the uh, systemic response is important because if you compare resistance exercise with sprint exercise, and they take about the same time, 15 minutes to complete, then there's much more, uh, m many more phosphocytes regulated in sprint, where we have a huge systemic response, huge adrenaline, a huge noradrenaline response. So that indicates that, that the intensity and perhaps also the systemic response is important for what is going on in, in the muscle. So endurance or duration by itself, I don't think matters that much. And what is the contribution ratio of blood flow versus uh, signaling to regulating glucose uptake? <laughs> well, it's 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 a it's a well it's a complicated question because let's say if if you are in the basal condition where you haven't eaten anything and your in plasma insulin is, is low, then just increasing flow by, uh, for instance, the pharmacological means will not increase your glucose uptake. But if you're in the insulin stimulated condition where glucose uptake is enhanced, then you can imagine that the flow actually is important and you can we we have actually looked at this by measuring the interstitial glucose concentration and during a clamp this uh, concentration actually decreases a bit but and if you then uh, regulate or decrease blood flow by pharmacological means then the interstitial glucose falls even more suggesting that there's an imbalance between the supply of glucose as well as the tissue uptake or the muscle uptake so i think in the condition where there is increased flux into the muscle of glucose, it could be either during insulin stimulation or during exercise, then the muscle blood flow is an important regulator. But if there's very little flux, then the blood flow doesn't matter, basically. And the next question is about phosphorylation of AMPK alpha 2. Uh, mm -hmm. and its effect on AMPK function, basically. Uh, and this is a question by Ian Salt from Glasgow. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. Um, I don't think we know, at least I don't know, uh, but it, it's, it looks like it has some, some function related to uh, insulin action, and it seems to be a positive regulator of insulin action. But um, I, I'm not uh, going further with this right now. I think it may be Jan Wojciechowski is, is a person who will probably uh, work more on this. Uh, so I, I, I don't really know, uh, Jan, but it's a good, very good question. Excellent. So the next question 
I says, uh, thanks, excellent talk. I noticed more overlap between sprint and RT than with aerobic uh, exercise. Uh, did you see any correlation of the uh, phosphoproteomic outcome and physiological parameters um, uh, such as lactate, stress, hormones, uh, power, output, oxygen, uh, uptake, etc.? In uh, other words, what do you think is mediating phosphorylating events? That was that was a long question. Um, <laughs> Well, I think, uh, I mean, there are similarities uh, because there's a lot of uh, stress, mechanical stress on the muscles with resistance and with sprint, which you don't find during endurance. And I think that the combination of, of uh, muscle activity, muscle uh, mechanical stress and uh, humoral response, the hormonal response during exercise is really driving the composite phosphorylation events that you see during uh, exercise. And that's why I think uh, resistance exercise and sprint are a little bit more similar than resistance exercise to, for instance, endurance or sprint versus endurance. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers most of the question. <laughs> Thank you. And um, unfortunately, I can't uh, read all the questions because of the time, but this would be the last question. What all is right. uh, considered the canonical pathways common to all three exercise modalities uh, are likely related to muscle contractions specifically? Uh, have you considered how these pathways might compare to other contraction types, such as shivering? Would you expect to uh, be a similar overlap? Uh, well, the short answer is I don't know because we haven't we haven't done that. And shivering is quite a different way of activating your muscle than a voluntary exercise. So, I mean, we've we identified these 428 phosphocytes that were common to these three different exercise modalities, and I think we have covered a pretty wide range of exercise modalities. But shivering is not one of them. And I would I would assume that the response, uh, the molecular response to shivering, is probably quite different from uh, from voluntary contractions. But we haven't done it, so I, I can't be sure. Thank you, Eric. Uh, so I would like to thank everyone for attending, and also our speaker, uh, Eric, um, uh, for the great presentation. You can continue the conversation online following uh, the, um, the basically um, the link that you can see on Twitter uh, on the screen. Uh, we welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers uh, to feature in this uh, biochemistry focus web webinar series. If you have any idea for a webinar in 2022, we invite you to submit a proposal for the next webinar. If you have missed any of the uh, webinars, uh, the 40 plus webinars that we run as part of the series, or you would like to watch them again, please uh, visit our website on YouTube channel, um, as you see uh, using the link that is shown on the screen. Uh, the recording from today's webinar will also be available to watch within the next couple of weeks. You can find more information about the webinars, you can propose your webinar, and you can also watch previous uh, recording. Uh, on our uh, website www.biochemistry.org um, uh, slash uh, webinars. Join us for the next webinar in the series. Uh, the title is uh, Fostering Laboratories and Cross-Disciplinary uh, Skills, a Digital Journey. Um, this will uh, happen on Wednesday, 27th of April um, at 3 p.m. UK time. Uh, at this webinar, we will hear from the Biochemical Society's 2021 Teaching Excellent uh, Winning Award, Dr. Rosemary um, uh, Klein at Queen Mary University of London. Rosemary joined Queen Mary's School of um, uh, Biological and Chemical Sciences as one of the first lectures uh, on the joint program in biomedical sciences with uh, Nanchong uh, Chinese University. So please uh, uh, join the session. Finally, I would like to highlight that in these challenging times, it's more important than ever to stay connected and engage with your fellow molecular bioscientists. It's an extraordinary time um, for us all, uh, but it's also an exciting time to join the Biochemical Society's community of researchers and uh, specialists. 
to stay connected and take advantage of uh, key benefits, in including uh, discounted registration fees for um, you know, society courses uh, and meetings, exclusive uh, access to a wide range of grants and bursaries, and also personal online access to two of their journals uh, and more and more. So uh, visit uh, the websites uh, to find out more about this. And uh, at the end, uh, I would like to thank you again all uh, for attending this um, webinar and also Eric for the great presentation. Have a good day. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.